Slave historian is known for his co-authoring of Salmon and His People. Dr. Steve Evans, with his deep connections to the Native people and marriage into the Nez Perce tribe, brings his expertise as the author of Voice of the Old Wolf and his PhD from WSU. Let's give a round of applause to Adam Pingo Sr. and Dr. Steve Evans as we look forward to engaging in the where you can interact with esteemed authors and gain valuable insights. Thank you. It's the eye out, Jordan. Thank you very much. You are here, you can look around, and the scenes of what we're going to talk about are around you right now and to our east and off to the west from here uh, all the way to the Dalles, Oregon. There's a big chunk of real estate that Nimipu and Lewis Clark people associated. And that was the focus of our, of our work. Uh, Alan, uh, former Marine, uh, insisted we do um, ground search for all of our evidence that we tried to gather and of course I was in the graduate school looking at documents and of course we looked at a lot of li literature but one of the things that we also tried to emphasize in our um, <clears throat> research was the um, intimate oral histories that somehow managed to come down through several generations of folks, not so much in direct Lewis Clark business, but in the area of tribal culture, which then spoke to us about the situations that we found described in the journals that Molten handily went through for us and uh, you know published and that enabled us to go through a lot of things and, and put those remarks by Lewis and Clark and Lewis and Clark's men into a kind of a cultural vortex and then examine some of the linguistics and some of the episodes to try and make decisions about what really happened. And one of the little slides I'll just describe to you, Alan standing in my dory in Hell's Canyon on the coldest day in October, 1999 or 2000, 2001, we had uh, the coldest October in history, in Hell's Canyon, the recorded history. We had the journals of Lewis and Clark with us. We were in an aluminum boat in the coldest day in October. <laughs> and no motor, we were just rowing uh, my dory, my whitewater dory. It happened to be, we were supposed to do this in the summer, but things, one thing led to another, it happened to be deer season. We had our rifles with us, of course. And uh, we're trying to find the spot that the Lewis and Clark people came into Hell's Canyon. And most people don't realize that. The first non-Indian people in Hell's Canyon were Lewis and Clark people. Ordway, Frazier, and Weezer were sent off on a little fishing expedition to get some fish. Go to this place, it's only a half a day away, they were told. Uh, that was the sign language we decided. It must have been some kind of sign. It's only half a day away. Well, that somehow got turned around to two days. It was two days to go from Kamei Valley over to Hell's Canyon. And so Alan and I were floating down there. Where did they go in Hell's Canyon? Uh, John Peeble said one thing, and the former head of the Idaho History Department said another thing. We had the journals and the boat, and so we were puttering along down through the canyon, but it was the coldest <laughs> October in the history of Hell's Canyon, and my Marine Corps friend fell out of the boat. <laughs> there were big chunks of ice coming out of Hell's Canyon. I was at the oars. I quick, 
basically reached out with an oar. And uh, he got a hold of it. I managed to get Alan back in the boat. I saved the former chairman's life. Give me that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the way I lived it. <laughs> You know, he, he got me in a boat in here, sit on this life jacket, but the aluminum boat seat is cold. So I did that. You know, I said, well, he knows, he's a captain, he knows what he's doing. Well, we go down, start to drift down, and I was just about to say the water's getting shallow, there was rocks sticking up. And we hit a rock and I went in the water. And uh, it was only waist deep out in the middle of the river, but then we came to a pool, and the water kept getting deeper and deeper. And there the water got up to my chin. I said, well, I better be getting out of this water. And so I looked at Steve, and he, he was, had an oar over his head, and he was, looked like he was going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> and, but he extended it out, and he and, uh, got me out. And then uh, when I was changing clothes on a bank there, I said, this son of a gun is trying to kill me. <laughs> you know, he, he had the excuse, oh, what am I going to tell his kids when I, when I, my partner drowned in the river. He was thinking that, but then I, on the other side, this guy's a dangerous human being. <laughs> you know, so, and, and why we did this, and uh, make this as a way of saying, every event has two sides to the view of what happened. And that's the way history is also. There's a loser and a winner side. Or, or uh, you know, things that happen. If you have three people, you'll probably get three different versions of the exact same event. Somebody's in the boat, and somebody's in the river, and somebody's watching from the bank. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I think it was just uh, mountain sheep and elk that was watching. <laughs> but you know, we were trying to make the point when this, and this is, it actually happened. I ended up in the river. With no life jacket and all that, and ice and going down the river. But what we were trying to point out when we tell this is that there's always two sides to any sport. And uh, Lewis and Clark, when we went through the journals, from what the things that I learned and heard from my uh, elders, was that this isn't the way a lot of things happened when Lewis and Clark came among us. And uh, so we try to present that side of the tribal view of these events on all en journal entries. And uh, a lot of things that they mentioned, oh, we wrecked the canoe today, you know, and we, everybody got out and we saved the baggage. No mentioning of tribal people diving in a river and removing their baggage from the river. They never mentioned that. And, and so there's, there again is a view of who is in the water and who isn't in the water. And uh, so and it kept going like this throughout the journal. And, and the other thing is uh, we spent more time in mileage and days spent with Lewis and Clark. A tribal member was with it, with Lewis and Clark. And it started right here down here at Lolo Creek. You know, the Indians that they met there, in our estimation, the way they described the country, they came from Cameo. And so they were Nespers. They weren't Salish Kootenai. They, they said, oh, there's some uh, tribal people from the north. Well, they weren't. <coughs> they were from Cameo. So that, that makes them Nespers. And they were looking for horses that the Shoshone had stolen from them. That's why they were there at uh, Lolo Creek. And of course, they were going south. And, uh, uh, and the other thing is that they never mentioned these travelers were teenagers, they were adult men. And, and I pointed out, I talked to the Blackfeet people, and they were up there for a bicentennial event with the Blackfeet. They said the two men that they say that Moses and Clark killed there were actually teenagers. Teenage black people. And so these were young men that traveled. In those days, young people had to learn a heck of a lot in a very short time. 
and, when, and they start learning just when they're able to comprehend, you know, three, four, five, six years old. By the time they're teenagers, they're traveling. And uh, so things in the cultural differences always show up in, in the journals also. And uh, like uh, when Lewis and Clark would come there, they would only talk to the men. They would never talk to women to find out what the women thought or what the women uh, should respond to from a woman's view. They always talk to the men. And, uh, and of course, in white society in those days, white women had very little uh, power, you know, economically and socially. But in an Esper's culture, the women were equal in our society as the men. They had their own cement ceremonies that they could perform. They held the uh, family unit together, and they controlled the property within the family. And they decided when they would get divorced also. <laughs> so if you found your moccasins outside the pinky, you were divorced. <laughs> so there's a lot of cultural differences, and then, of course, the culture crash as well. And one of the things when they heard that Lewis and Clark were coming, they had passed through here, and uh, they were down at Weeye. The discussion was, should we kill them? Because we knew they were bringing good things and bad things to us. And the reason we knew that is that we acquired the horse about 1700. We had the horses about 100 years before those were quite short. Well, there were three nest at Fort Mandan in 1803. Why were there nest persons in Mandan in 1803? We wanted to find out what's going on. And we know at that time, in the 1800s and probably prior to that, the treatment of the Eastern tribes by white society wasn't very good. And in fact, we genocide in some, some types of Pequots was nearly wiped out completely. But nowadays, the Pequots have the biggest casino in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and it buys their land back. But this is uh, some of the differences that we tried to point out in this book. And uh, we had a lot of good comments from uh, some people that reviewed our book. And they said, well, this is a story that they never heard before from the tribal uh, group because very few uh, historians ask the right questions. So this is why we put this book here. We're here to have a good time and for us all to learn together. If anybody has comments or questions as we're going along, uh, don't be bashful. I would uh, mention, since Alan brought up about the power of the women, I'd like to introduce my wife, Connie, over here. <laughs> she uh, she kind of helped her and Alan and I around a little bit uh, here and there when we required it. And as Alan pointed out, the women, the old time women's tradition was they owned their own horses, they owned their own saddles, they owned the teepees. If you came back to the teepee and your hunting gear was outside, your saddle was outside, your moccasins were there, as Alan said, that you didn't need an attorney. You needed to go back to where you came from and start over. So anyway, uh, uh, my wife is a lineal descendant of one of those, you know, some of those powerful women, and uh, and she was also a retired uh, officer in the United States Army. And so, uh, I, I, although I am not a veteran, I've learned to salute. <laughs> and, uh, she carries some clout, you know. So anyway, uh, I'm treading very lightly, you know, all the time. And it's important to do that. And we all who are married a long time know what I'm talking about. So anyway, um, uh, speaking of marriages, there was a special cultural marriage that, uh, 
that kind of took place when groups of people came together. Um, this always happens, you know, in big cities. Uh, we, we understand that, you know, the crossroads of the world, you know, the, the trade crossroads and so on. Well, they didn't have that exactly in this region, but they did have places that were temporary major crossroads of people's travels. We, we know, for example, Celilo, coastal people came to Celilo on the Columbia, Plains people, Plateau people were over there from the east. Buffalo Heights came from the Plains, Shells came from the coast. It was a major trading area and uh, people would meet, they would gamble, they would compare religions and, and share religious ceremonies. So there are all these things going on like a city. And uh, one of the things that happened at these deals was uh, boy meets girl. And that led to uh, uh, relationships and that relationship, which was often temporary, sometimes it developed into something permanent, but that relationship was vital to trade. And trade is vital to diplomacy. We read in the paper today, we see in the news about Red China and our concerns about Red China. And we all have cause to be concerned, and the Chinese are concerned also, because Look at our trade. Our trade is vital to us, it's vital to them. So, one of the things that happened when Nimipu met Lewis and Clark was two potentially powerful groups had to make a decision about one another and their relationship. And so they had these relationships, uh, diplomatic relationships, and this was reflected a lot in the trade that took place. The Americans had a technology that the natives obviously held in high esteem. The collective native power was something that had to be respected by Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark had the most guns of any single group probably in the West. And Alan and I wrote about one poor unlucky deer trying to swim the Clearwater River and five or six guys from Lewis Clark's expedition run up to the bank and finish this deer off. It's been chased into the river by Indian hunters. I say, this is the unluckiest deer in the West. There's only one place in the American West where there were probably five or six rifles all in one spot and this poor deer is surrounded by these people. So. Uh, the technology and the diplomacy, all of this is important. Just down the road from us here, in Kamii, on the return trip, Lewis and Clark uh, had to spend more time than they really wanted to. They wanted to get back on the trail and get over here. How deep do you think the snow was here at that time? You know, it was uh, in the spring, and, the, and the, the snow was, we don't even know how deep it was here, but not very far from Kamii, it was 20 and 25 feet deep in places. Um, our uh, famous Lewis and Clark author, and World War II author, uh, uh, huh? Steve Ambrose. Ambrose. Ambrose said that they pushed their horses through 12 foot of snow. Well, okay, I think he meant there was the snow was really deep. I don't think they were riding their horses through 12 feet of snow. Maybe over the top of the really hard places in the snow. But what they did then, while they were waiting, was to carry on diplomacy. And a lot of this was sports. You know, it was ping pong diplomacy. It was the Olympics. Uh, it was uh, young men and young women getting to know each other. And with the blessings of the older adults who had scoped out the situation, and the situation was that if you have marriages, you will have offspring, and these offspring are agents of diplomacy. They will understand both cultures, both languages. They can represent mother, represent father, 
or that line. And so like with the Yakima people, like with other tribal peoples, certain bands of Shoshones, a uh, little rogue band of Blackfeet, there were different people that the Nez Perces were periodically allied. Pacific Northwest was predated by a grand council that was held in Kamei Valley in 1806. This, the things that are written into the treaty of 1855 were almost uh, identical to oral agreements that were uh, represented by exchange of gifts and um, verbal agreements between Lewis and Clark and the various Mioka, the diplomatic chiefs of uh, the Nez Perce. And that was, uh, dis we described that in our text as the Grand Council. That's what uh, Lewis and Clark referred to it as, as the Grand Council. So we just used his language, their language, and called it the Grand Council. And then in the last chapters, we describe how closely the relationship uh, in the post-treaty period was uh, predated by this oral arrangement of the Grand Council and how the people who signed the Treaty of 1855, many of those people, there were over 50 uh, diplomatic chiefs and leaders that signed the 55 Treaty, many of them we can positively identify as having uh, very close relations to the Lewis and Clark Party. They supported the United States. They supported uh, the policies of the United States. Their policies they saw were parallel to U.S. policy as far as the trade and as far as peace went. This is shown by Lewis and Clark to be desirable, and the tribal people who heard that story agreed with them. This is a good idea. You don't have to go hunting in Montana and fear for your life from Blackfeet enemies or other enemies. It's not good that people raid one another, kill one another. Uh, they could see the obvious advantage of uh, a legal agreement. And that's what the Grand Council was. That's what the Treaty 55 was. Uh, things started breaking down when the power relationship changed. Uh, Lewis and Clark uh, had a lot of power. They had a lot of powder and ball and rifles, but they were way outnumbered. And, uh, and, and the intelligence of the ground conditions, of course, they were completely outclassed by the Nez Perce. But um, later on, that changes. So uh, we uh, explored that aspect. And uh, in doing that, uh, where we got a lot of this was from um, talking to elders, you know, people that we know that had a lot to say, and uh, it hadn't been written down, but uh, people with knowledge, um, there are a lot of things I could mention, and, and, and maybe we will get into some of that, but, um, yeah, uh, what Steve was talking about, the union between uh, a Nespers woman and William Clark, that, that union produced Pala Skuka, and he was a male, and he went to the 1855 treaty time to the sketch made of him of a red-headed Indian at the 1855 <coughs> treaty negotiation. And, uh, since he is the son of uh, William Clark, Pala Skuka, we called William Clark Halak Tuke also. So his son became Halak Tuke Jr. And Halak Tuke Jr. is mentioned in about three or four different places in, in the history renditions of the Northwest. But he never became a real influential tribal member that influenced tribal culture or uh, tribal society. You know, as opposed to the place that he was half and half, of course. 
But the intention of him being born half and half is that he was the alliance built. And he was the diplomatic uh, connection between the United States government and the ministers. Well, it never occurred on a strong, very strong basis. He's mentioned here and there, but uh, and there's even a photo of him on the Yellowstone River. And, but he never became very prominent. The intention was that he was supposed to be the building block between two different societies. But it never occurred. It occurred to a little degree, but not a, a, a very large degree. And there's also other alliances that were uh, completed also. Uh, some of the other expedition members, they, they, when they were camped at Kanyai, in the journals it's mentioned some of the men went across the river to trade. Well, they did trade, but it, it, sometimes it wasn't for material things. So, and the most prolific one was York. He probably left more prodigy along the Lewis and Clark than anyone else. Because most of the tribes that we've talked to, oh well, yeah, we have a York descendant. So the curiosity was about him. Oh, he must have stood in the smoke too long, that's why he's black. And we'd go up to him, lick our thumb and rub his arm, and the black wouldn't come off. And so he, uh, he was a curiosity to us at that time. But later, uh, we, we know who the, the, our tribal people are that descended from York. Uh, not too many people talk about it, but it, it did occur. And so, and other tribes did this as well. You know, I've heard comments sometimes that, oh, Rosa Clark, they were, uh, you know, they were upper class people. They wouldn't do such a, such a thing as fraternize. Well, I think it's a lot different than we speak about. It's alliance about it between two different societies. That's what it's done. So, and that's a difference that uh, cultural practice, well, it's not really <coughs> different. European culture did this constantly in Europe with royalty intermarriages. So what's the difference? You know, so, uh, so that was one aspect of the, uh, what we talked about in this book, and uh, the other one was um, Lewis and Clark didn't seem to know anything about Sandwich. And they sent these three men to uh, to the salmon river, supposedly to uh, purchase uh, salmon. Now they did find some salmon in, well, in a place we call Sukhanna, and that is called Kuka Creek, or Kuka Creek far on the Snake River right now. And it was a large settlement of uh, Nesper's people. And they went there, and they were guided by one of the lawyer friends and a couple of other boys, I think. And well, the problem here was uh, Ordway and his partners acquired about, oh, I, I think it was about 17 cents. Yeah, that was 17. Yeah. And they hung them up on a rack, and they're going to leave the next morning. Now the next morning, all of a sudden, some of their salmon was gone. So Ordway writes in his journal, so there was salmon stolen from us. We weren't stealing. This is called in our culture redistribution of life sources. It's not stealing. There's a salmon leader in each village. He oversees the harvest of salmon. And if anyone in the village does not have salmon, and salmon are brought in, he will direct that salmon to the family that needs it right there. He makes that decision. Well, this is what happened to Ordway and his set. There was somebody in so those seven were given up. So there, there, there again, this is a cultural difference. You know, when somebody
somebody pays for something, they expect to keep it. Well, not in our society. When food is needed, it is always given out. It's never kept. And uh, the other thing that we mentioned, that this is when he came back, in his journals when he was at uh, Sakatma or Kugubar, he wrote in his journals that they seen uh, mountain sheep. And uh, and he want, made another note, the housing that they have, or shacks, looks the same as the ones that he seen in survival down in Columbia. And uh, he complained about it. It rained one, one of the days that he was there. And he said, oh, these uh, dwellings leak. But what, what I'm trying to describe here is that the salmon culture was very important to us at that time. Well, it is still important to us right now also. But our, uh, that life source is good one quite rapidly right now. So, But in those days, you could hear salmon coming up the river. You heard them before you saw them. That's how much how much they made a disturbance in the water that you could hear it when they were coming up. You may not see them, but you heard the thrashing and splashing when they came up with it. That's how many salmon that were there. And I'm talking about millions. I'm not talking about a hundred or two hundred thousand. I'm talking about millions of salmon that came up the snake in the clear water the Salmon River and the Grand Ground. And they even went up to, to the Hawaii River in Nevada. So there was a lot of salmon. So we were heavily dependent on this life of salmon. And then we would go to the plains as well to uh, get buffalo and buffalo product. And we even walked there to the plains area to collect buffalo because uh, that also was very important. But when we acquired the horse about 1700, we could go there and we could spend two to three years on a plane collecting buffalo. And we would come back with pack horses just full of buffalo meat and buffalo product, buffalo robes. So that was also a very uh, important life source for us. And this photo that we put on our cover is done by John Sebbett. He's a uh, Nespers artist. And we seen this photo, and he said, oh, this is going to be put on our uh, cover. Because he did this uh, painting and he based it on the time period of Lewis and Clark, the 1800s. And that's how Nespers' looked in the 1800s, just like this painting. So we went to the uh, person that bought the painting and asked him if we could use it on the book, and he said yes. It only cost us, what, one book? One book. Yeah. One book. <laughs> what a steep price. <laughs> but he, he was a very good artist. <coughs> So if you take a close look, uh, he, he's not using a bridle, it's a, a tie on the lower jaw. Uh, he's got a trailer, what we call a trailer. And it's right here, you know, underneath the belly of the horse. The trailer is, if you have riding a tra uh, horse that's not well trained, if you lose control of the horse and you get you know, bucked off or somehow disconnected from the horse, that horse will have a trailer that you can always reach out and grab and bring him back. Or if he runs away, you will know, eventually catch up with him. You can drive that trailer and get him back in control. So, and then we also learned how to yell. Stallion. We chose Lucy Clark how to yell the stallion. And they said it, it was much better than their method because the recovery of that stallion was much longer than what, when Lewis and Clark did it. When we showed them how to kill, within a few days, that stallion or that gilding became useful. 
So there, and where did we live at? We probably went down to the Gulf of Mexico and, and, uh, and into some Spanish people that taught us how to do that. So, and, and what this depicts is that Nez Perce people travel, even on foot, they traveled in all directions. And when we acquired the horse, we even traveled further than we did on foot. We went to the Great Lakes area to travel, uh, to trade for yellow pi uh, red pipe stuff. So, and my father used to tell us, yeah, we used to go there and we get the red pipe stuff. And, and then we, we traveled down and we met the Spanish people. We called the people that wore the little blanket and wore a hat. And of course we went north to the Great Slave Lake and then to the coast of the Puget Sound tribes. And so we're not the only tribe that traveled. Others, I, went, I knew a Navajo that I met when I was on the National Museum of American Indian Board of Trustees. And I asked him, how did you guys travel? Where did you go to when you, before you got the horse? And he said, oh, we have had runners. We'd send runners to the East Coast just to find out what's going on. Find out about Columbus and the ships that came in. So when people come out here and say, oh, you're just poor and wretched, that's what Wilson uh, Clark called Indian, poor and wretched creatures. They call the Shoshone Bannock people that. We were not poor and wretched. As far as the religion or spirituality of Indian people, I think we knew much, just as much as anyone else. We call what you call, uh, or the God, we call him Hanyuat, the creator, the one that made this whole world for us. We call him Hanyuat, the creator. So we already knew that when Bruce and Clark were. When we ask him questions about religion, we ask the question, is the earth the mother and the son the father? They got up in their tirades and said, no, 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 we don't talk about that kind of stuff. We talk about Christianity. So there again, here's this different than cultural views talking about the same person up there. Two different views of how to honor and pay your religious devotion to someone. A lot different. Waka. When Alan says Waco, he means I'm done for a few minutes. And then I have to give him the microphone back again. Anyway, if anybody's just dying to ask a question, boy, this is a good time to do it. He's two months older than I am. Um, when we were going to, for an expedition out on the plane, it was usually for Buffalo. And we would spend two to three years over there collecting buffalo. And it, uh, what they would do, they would, someone, some leader would say, I'm going to the buffalo country, who wants to go with me? And uh, he would collect anywhere from 50 to 200 Nanibu. And they would move to the plains and with all their baggage, and then they'd spend two to three years there and then come back. And, and of course, uh, when you did that, you had to build these alliances or this, uh, uh, at least declare peace long enough for you to accomplish what you went for the plains for. And that meant some gift giving or ceremonial uh, recognition for certain people. You know, so it had to be a diplomat as well because uh, there were, there were tribal societies that protected uh, their tribe, usually of young, experienced uh, men. And they would be the protectors of all the uh, tribes, you know. Not, not the tribes to get through and to, to, to pass through the country. And of course, other times, 
when you threw the sign, you know, we, we were taught Indian sign language, and the first question would be, question, what are you called? And when you reply, they say, oh, I know that name, I know who you are. Or it would come back, you killed one of my relatives, how are we going to sit down to smoke the peace, or shall we now fight? So those decisions had to be made. So you could run into some hostility, but you could also run into your allies as well. And so, did they bring their families with them if they're going for two Yes, they would. They would bring their family. <laughs> okay. so, the whole family unit would go. So the young men grew up going to find the buffalo. Got it. Yeah, and see this, when, when you brought the whole family, you those young children are learning what you are doing. They're watching it. Or they're being told through stories that what you should watch for, what are the dangers, and what are the good sides. So that, that whole expedition would be a, a learning experience for that group of people. And some of our best leaders are the travelers. Pilot Crowd, Joseph, the one that became known as Lawyer, and Red Bear. Uh, those experienced men became the leaders in 1877 during our war with the United States. So building leadership was also done when they would go on these expeditions. I'd like to add one quick thing to that, and that is that everybody who's familiar with the 1877 war realizes that the United States Army with their horses and their men and their armament, for the most part, could not catch an Esper's family with their women and kids and old people. <laughs> that is historical fact, it's just the way it is because they've been practicing for years. Uh, Chief uh, Many Wounds was raised in the White Bird area. He swam Salmon River every day when it's some, from the time he learned to swim, he could swim for Salmon River every day, summer and winter. Their horses were taught to swim the river. The horses were driven into the river in shallow waters, and then into shallow currents, the mother, the mares kept their colts on the downstream side, break the current. The colts learned water from their mothers. Uh, Indian children were taught to swim the same way. Go in the river in the summertime in the shallow areas downstream from your mother. The children are taught to swim. One of the things that we found is talking to the elders was uh, uh, this came down through generations. We talked to a number of elders who said, well, one of the things that was upsetting to uh, the Nez Perses, or with a, a source of astonishment to the Nez Perses, was these grown men, some of them didn't know how to swim. They tipped the canoes over in the Salmon River, and they grab a hold of a big rock, and that's it. They're out there stuck there until somebody comes out and rescues them. They didn't know how to swim. And that was laughable. You know, what? They, adult people, they don't know how to swim. And then we see the army trying to chase the uh, uh, Nez Perses across Salmon River. Same thing, Nez Perses cross the river. Men, women, children, horses, cattle, all swim the river. General Howard come along with his, his uh, troopers. They can't get across the river. What are we gonna do? The, the Nez Perses were on the hills across from Whitebird, they could see him up there with their telescope and their binoculars. They were laughing at him. They were turning their breech clouts down and showing them their backside and laughing at him. And, uh, you know, that again is a matter of historical record. And it, was, it wasn't that funny, but I mean, it was different. Uh, and uh, uh, so this, these trips out onto the plains, in a sense, were uh, a dress rehearsal for uh, moving. Uh, my wife and I have been making teepees for 40 years and we do little teepee demonstrations we have in the past. We're kind of getting tired of it, but too old. But uh, One of the things we do with school children when it comes, we put the teepee up and we talk about the teepee and the circle and the family and where your place is in the teepee and stuff. And then class is over, it's time to go. How long does it take to take that teepee down? And we do this kind of as a joke, but uh, you pull those pins 
and one person goes this way with the part of the TP and one person goes the other way with the other part of the TP and tip that pole over and leave the pole if you can always get new poles. And I always tell the kids this, when you start pulling those pins, say, soldier's coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was a phrase, I forgot what it was, but it means soldier's coming and that, and the that thing that goes along with that is the word hom tits. Hurry up, soldier's coming. Didn't take long, it doesn't take long to take the TV down if you know soldiers are coming. <laughs> So anyway, there you go, Alan. <laughs> well, they, they weren't large courses. You know, they weren't 17 hands high. They were more like 14 and maybe a big horse would be 15 hands. And uh, they were originally probably from the Cayuse that came up from the south. And uh, they became uh, Cayuse because the Cayuse people had Cayuse horses. And, but, so it wasn't a large horse. What, what we were looking for was a short-footed horse, you know, one that would survive winters. You know, when a severe winter came along, you wanted a horse to survive. And uh, we would teach, when it, winter became very hard, we taught the horses how to eat the inner bark of the tree, the pine tree, basically, lots of pine and some of the willow. And so they could survive the winter that way. And uh, so if you had a 17-hand horse, you had to feed him a hell of a lot to keep him from starving. And uh, the good horse was one that you could ride hands-free next to a buffalo that's running. That's a good horse. You just guide him by pressure, you know, tell him where to go and you put an arrow or a shot into a running buffalo. That is a good horse. But it, it probably needs a lot of training. And uh, they would even stake the horse out right next to the teepee and keep him there. So he would always be a heavy connection between rider and the horse. Sometimes you wouldn't get a good connection with the horse and that that horse wouldn't treat you very well. It might even put you on the ground now and then. But uh, the value of a horse is very, very high to us because you could train that horse to do many things. And uh, and also, like I said, you just guide it with your knee pressure or hand. And, uh, now, the other thing, we every family didn't have an Appaloosa horse. <laughs> That's kind of a mythical kind of thing. But what, what we call a spotted horse like this on our cover, we call it mom and sicker, a Mormon horse. That's what that means, a Mormon. We couldn't say Mormon, so we said mom and. And uh, so we call this kind of horse a Mormon horse because we went south to Utah to trade for these spotted horses and a multi-colored horse. Now the Mormons had those kinds of horses. So that's where we first got the what we what became known as Appaloosa horse. When the settlers and traders came out, they learned that there were good horses at the place that's called Palouse the Palouse River. There were nest groups down there that raised horses. They had vast horses, uh, herds of horses. And so the settlers would go there and say, I want an Appaloose horse, an Appaloose horse. Well, it got corrupted to Appaloosa. When the Appaloosa Horse Club was formed, they said, well, why don't we just call this part of the horse an Appaloosa? So that's how it, the name came about. And George Hadley was one of the founders of that. And there were several other young, uh, men at that time. They started that in the 1930s, I believe. And then there's the Appaloosa Horse Museum in Moscow, Idaho now. So, uh, the one, uh, Jesse Redhart raised Appaloosa horses. He was the only one, there were maybe one or two other families that raised Appaloosa horses, but Jesse Redhart was my brother-in-law, 
and he worked with George Hadley, and they would go to various horse shows. And, uh, of course, Jesse would dress up in his war bonnet and his buckskins, and you know, he would ride his apples and horse and that would be to show off that way. But uh, George Hadley and my brother-in-law, Jesse, they did a lot of horse shows, and uh, they were pretty well known during, during that time. But now, what, what the breeders are doing, they want an Arabian with spots, or a thoroughbred with spots. So a lot of people are trying that. Some of them are successful about it, and they're, they're pretty proud of that kind of thing. But the real Appaloosa was a smaller horse, and more likely came from the Cayuse portion of the herds. But the Appaloosa horse, what we call Appaloosa horse now, was in China for 7,000 years. And uh, it shows up here in, when the Spanish came over. So that's kind of a nice little interesting story. What police, uh, what, what happened, she was stolen from us when she was a young child, probably seven, eight, nine years old. And she was taken east by the the tribe that told we don't know who which tribe it could have been Blackfeet or Crow or Sioux or uh, Shoshone Bannock we don't know. Uh, but she was raised in the Midwest around the Dakotas and the Great Lakes area, and she was married to and she was traded off more likely to a white man. And, of course, he took her in as a wife, and they had a child. Well, all of a sudden, this uh, white guy says, well, I'm going to go back to Europe. And uh, Wakui says, no, I'm not going with you. She won the argument somehow. And uh, so she, with her child, she started coming west. And the man went to Europe. And she struggled coming back. But uh, the wolves showed her how to get back home. There's another little story about that. But she, she gets home, and when she goes older, she's an elderly lady at Weite Meadow when Lewis and Clark show up. And uh, this is where the discussion was, was uh, should we kill him or not? But there's another side story to this. Red, Red Bear was, had gone south to take revenge on a Shoshone that had killed three of our emissaries earlier that summer. So the real fighting men were gone from the village at this time. But they still discussed, well, should we kill them? And we act, there was an actual ambush site at, on Weite Prairie that we were going to ambush them. But then what Kui says, do these people no harm because this white man that I was with treated me well? And I guess some of the other white people that she had met also treated her well, also. So that's why she said, do them no harm. And so she was kind of the deciding vote not to ambush Lewis and Clark. So then it was decided, well, let's treat them well, you know, give them food, guide them, you know, they ask for something, we'll try to get it for them. So she was kind of deciding uh, vote on that. So that's why they never, they never got killed. Does Lewis and Clark never mention her in their journals? Uh, yeah. Not specifically, no. Well, not by name, but they, yeah. they call her an elder, uh, elderly woman, I think. It's okay. Now, that, that's why there's very little notion <coughs> about Indian women all through their journey. Very little. All except one they had, uh, I think at Fort Mandan, one of the members of the expedition got involved between a man and a woman. And uh, Sorry, he got, he got uh, disciplined for it. <laughs> uh, what happened to Havas Duque? He, was red, he had red hair and light colored eyes. And so you know he was mixed. And uh, 
He went through the war of 1877. He was an older man. He was, he would have been 70 years old or 71, something like that. And so he was an elderly man when, in 1877. So he went with the, through the war. And he ends up in uh, Oklahoma. And they were losing tribal people there because of the diseases and wounds. And he was one. He, he succumbed. Uh, he, I don't know whether he passed away from old age or something else. I don't know. But he died in Oklahoma. So he had heirs? Pardon? He had sons and daughters? No. We don't know. No, for some reason, you know, that didn't occur. No grandkids. Yes, we are. Uh, we, you know, uh, they, they were recognized by Lewis and Clark because we made an oral treaty with them. And when 1855 comes along, uh, Kamayakan, the Yakima people, didn't like the provisions in the treaty, so he rebelled and became a renegade. And he was traveling around to different tribes and U.S. cavalry and uh, uh, volunteer citizenry were trying to catch up to him and eliminate him. Now, well, during that time, Chief Timothy, who had met Lewis and Clark in 1805, said he was going to try to help them, uh, the U.S. Army, and try to reduce this rebellion. That's why Timothy and about uh, almost 30 other Nez Perses joined uh, Steptoe when he was fighting the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene in 1858. Chief Timothy was still trying to keep the peace because we made this peace treaty with Lewis and Clark in 1806. So that's how we were recognized by the United States, by an oral treaty and helping out uh, Steptoe and Colonel Wright to catch up to Kamaya. But in, in the stead, they fought the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene, who had nothing to do with Kamaya. But uh, some of Coeur d'Alene and some of Coeur, uh, Spokane tribal people got killed by Wright and uh, Steptoe. So it wasn't, it wasn't a just war at all <laughs> during that time. Well, sometimes these marriages or unions were agreed to, but never officially had any ceremonial activity to it. Uh, Gordon Fisher told us a little story. He said when there was a union, there would be a witness to that union to make sure that we knew who made the baby. So officially, so if that baby that was born of that union, it was assured that he was the descendant of these two people because there was a witness to it. That's how important these relationships were at some time. And sometimes there were a very elaborate ceremonies, particularly between uh, leaders of two different tribes. And uh, exchange of goods. Uh, Red Bear, he was the leader during the Lucy Clark time, and he had a Nez Perce wife and a Salish wife. He had two wives. And I'm sure he would have had a ceremony because these were officially marriages. One was for the Hawaii uh, tribe, and the other was for uh, probably a family here with the Nez Perce. And sometimes there were very elaborate ceremonies for marriages. Just like today. Certificates or daytime smoker related to red trip to Well, that, I, I couldn't confirm it, but I was pretty well assured by the things that I've heard that the child was connected to red family family somehow. Either a, a daughter or a sister that had a 
I, I know that because of uh, some of the references and uh, stories I had, and because of certain leadership, that that's what occurred. And because uh, Harvard Tulsa Jr. had red hair, and uh, William Park had red hair. And then we, in the book, we have a portrait of Halaf Turkip and a painting of William Clark side by side. And it just looked like father inside. So you'll see it in this book. So as far as we know, Clark never uh, recognized his son, right? He didn't know about it. Um, you know, but when did he send some um, Nespers and Sailors back to St. Louis in what, 1833? And the women said, make sure you tell William Clark his son is doing very well. I don't know whether William Clark recognized that or not. More than likely not, because. Uh, any writing of William Clark, I, I don't think we ever ran across any reference to that. We looked for a reference because they did have a an audience with Clark, and uh, uh, but we're also thinking Clark had a wife in St. Louis, and I, I got a suspicion that probably he doesn't want to talk about what he was doing in Idaho when he was a young man. <laughs> Especially since Judas was around before he left. Well, he was a long ways from home and he was in the army. Come on. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. You know, what, what did uh, what kind of relationship does the Nespers tribe have with the U.S. military? There was a mixed blood Nez Perce Delaware Indian that fought in the Civil War on the Union side. His English name became Tom Hill. I can't remember his Nez Perce name. Then he comes back and he joins up with Joseph here at Lolo Pass. Or actually, probably down there at Fort Fizzle. Somewhere in this area, he joined up with Joseph. And he fought with Joseph against the U.S. Army, which he was formerly a member of. And then we have the Spanish-American War. We have one tribal member that served there. He was in the Philippines. And then World War II comes. My father served in France in World War I. And about 12 other Nez Perce as well. And I think uh, maybe two or three of them got killed, but I, I can't recall that right now. And and so we were involved in all the all the wars that the United States were involved in since the Civil War. And then World War II comes along, and we have I think about 80 nest groups that served in World War II, and I have two older brothers that served. One was in the army, and the other was in the navy. The one that was in the army survived Omaha Beach. He said later, before he passed on, he said, all, all my friends in my platoon were getting killed all around me when he hit Omaha Beach. And the last story he told us, he was in a second wave on a landing craft for the personnel. He was in a second wave and he, he said when that ramp went down, all the people that were in front were immediately killed. So he got, well, I'll jump off to the side, and he did. Then he started to sink, he had a pack and a rifle, so he got out of his pack, threw his, dropped his rifle, and started to swim. And one of his uh, members of his platoon got hit. And he grabbed his friend's arm and he's by the hand. And he starts pulling him into the beach, which was several hundred yards away. He doesn't remember how he got to the beach. 
because things were going on all around him. And, but he got to the beach somehow, and he told his friend and his buddy, we made it, we made it. He pulls up him by the arm, and all he has is his arm and his friend. So <clears throat> he went through a pretty tough time. And then he was put in a, a mobile artillery unit. And he told about having artillery duels with the Germans. And people again, he, he lost all of his buddies around the artillery unit. And he was in a second take going through the hedgerows. He was in a mo mobile artillery on a tank chassis. <coughs> and the, the driver or the sergeant who was in charge says, I got a radio power, can I stop and get my radio fixed? So they stopped and the other tanks went on and all the other tanks were wiped out. He was that one tank was surviving. He went through one year of steady combat. And then he was put in this uh, special unit trying to find Hitler. They went to Yugoslavia and I don't know where else and he went back to France and he went back to Luxembourg and all over the place looking for Hitler. They never found him. And when they counted points to get shipped back to the States after the war's end, my brother had the highest points. They flew him back because he had one of the highest points in the whole year. And of course, he had PTSD really bad. So, um, now that was one brother. Then my next brother, Nicole, was really. He was in the Navy, and he, he was in the Navy Guard. And he went to every Pacific port in the Pacific during World War II. Australia, New Zealand, you know, uh, United States, you know, San Diego and all those ports. And, uh, and he, he, one thing he said, he said, when I heard that, they dropped the first atomic bomb on, on Hiroshima. I was in, at sea, and he just turned, I think, 21, I think. Or, or was getting, uh, going to be uh, a year old. So, he didn't see a lot of combat, but uh, I'm sure he must have gotten in one of these uh, uh, convoy fights, you know. And, and that's he was a 20 millimeter gunner and a two and three inch uh, artillery piece on board ship. And then he, he never got out until March of 46 because they had to trans, he was looking for Japanese that surrendered, or didn't surrender that were on the islands. They had to go island to island to talk to these Japanese uh, the war was over. And then they went through Panama Canal and then uh, they got a shipload of Germans to take back to Germany. And then they discharged him finally. And uh, I have all kinds of cousins that were in Korea and Vietnam. And, and, uh, I joined up in 1956, got out in 58, but I served one year in Okinawa. And uh, so I missed all the bad stuff. I was right after Korea and got out just before uh, Vietnam. And my son Levi, he, he joined up when he got out of high school. He joined the Marine Corps. He said, Dad, I want to join the same way you did. So he joined the Marine Corps. And he became a water purifier, purification technician. So he traveled all over the... He went to Japan and Thailand and I don't know, Australia, I don't worry all that, but he went all over to Korea, he went to Korea. And in my tour, I, I went to Okinawa, I went to the Philippines twice, I went to uh, uh, Taiwan once, I went to uh, Korea, so, uh, and Hawaii, I went to Hawaii twice. So, so uh, 
My grandfather was in World War, uh, 1877 war. It, his job was to watch the horses. And uh, he survived the big hole battle. And because a lot of the children were orphans, he was chosen. He was 17 at that time. He was chosen. You take these five boys and you go back to Lapway. So they came from Big Hole through this country and went to Lapway. And they were pointed out, oh, those are the boys that were this Joseph. So they were arrested and sent to Vancouver, Washington, to the uh, military base down there. Then they were sent to Oklahoma. And my grandfather spent two years in Oklahoma. And then he was exiled back and uh, repatriated. And uh, ironically, he comes back, and his father helped survey the Nespers Reservation with Alice Fletcher during the Gaza, where the, the land was allotted to individual Indians. Well, my great grandfather and my grandfather helped survey the reservation with Alice Fletcher. Oklahoma is just a place to send Indians that were exiled. Cherokee and other tribes, some of the Missouri River tribes were sent to Oklahoma. And uh, we were sent there af after the, the War of 1877. We were sent to Port Leavenworth first, and about 30 of our people died there from the wounds and diseases. And then when they went from Port Leavenworth to near Tonkawa, uh, we probably lost another 100 people from disease and wounds also. So we lost quite a few people down in Oklahoma because they had no resistance to diseases, of course, but they never survived their wounds. And, and there's burial grounds down there at right? Fort Leavenworth. They have a little monument there at Fort Leavenworth. And then uh, the graveyard in Oklahoma near Tonkawa, it was wiped out. The farmer took it over and just plowed everything under. But there was some Tonkawa people that remembered where the graveyard was. So about, uh, I think it was in a, about 1990 sometime, the Tonkawa people invited us sometime, uh, some of us to go down there. I didn't go. But uh, they said, we know where your graveyard is. If you send somebody down, we'll point it out and we'll mark it. And, and then we'll put a fence around it. And uh, the stones that were marking the grave, the farmers picked them up and threw them in a gully. So that's why we, nobody could find it. But the Tonkwa people remembered where it was. So we reestablished that uh, graveyard. And it was somewhere around 100 people. And, uh, and then uh, after Joseph went to Washington, D.C. to plead his cause, about returning to Idaho, he, he won the argument. He was he was sent back in 1885, and they were they they got the Walla Walla area near where the river comes out. The Walla Walla river comes out. They stopped them. They, they were taken off the boat. They came up from Oklahoma mostly by train at that time and then up the river by steamboat. I think. And they stopped there and put them off there near Walla Walla and they asked them a question. Do you want to go back to Idaho or are you going to go with Jesus, uh, Joseph and be yourself? What that meant was, do you want to be a Christian? You can go to Idaho if you want to be yourself, you can practice your own religion if you go to the Colville Reservation. That's what that meant. So, when it comes to freedom of religion, we, we, we never had that. And now, what, one of the prophecies that I heard, it will take five generations for the next person to recover from the coming of the white man. 
we are in the sixth generation now. The reason I say that is we have a casino that generates a hell of a lot of money. Yeah, and it, it, it's, uh, it took us a while to get it developed, but uh, there was a lot of argument even among ourselves you know, between a Christian those person and some of the traditional people. Ah, oh, we shouldn't be gambling at all. But, but we would say, but it's other people's money. It's not ours. You build it, they will come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I would like to thank everyone who showed up here today. We really appreciate your interest. We're not going to leave. We're going to hang around. We'll be here to talk to you. Sign books, hopefully. Alan and I each get 50 cents each every time we sell a book, so we're pretty excited. And uh, anyway, uh, I just said that because I saw the WSU editors uh, in the crowd out here. And I, uh, I was kind of bucking for 75 cents. And, uh, but anyway, we really appreciate you here. We appreciate your interest. We'll be here to talk to you, to sign books, chat it up. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, really, really, we say Tetsi Yao Yao. Thank you. I'm Christopher Noyes, Deputy District Ranger on the Locksaw Powell for the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest. Uh, it has been an honor having Alan and Stephen up here to give uh, their perspective on the Nez Perce tribe's interaction with the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, grateful that we had the ability to host them up here and uh, that they were able to share their perspective of the story. My name is Jim Sace and I'm president of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. And I find it interesting that we're standing within a couple hundred yards of the Continental Divide. And what I enjoyed about the talk was the discussion, you know, are you in the boat or out of the boat or in the water or on the bank? Uh, or in this case, you're on one side of the mountain or the other side of the mountain. And that speaks to uh, if there's a divide between us, you have to be able to reach across it using the tools at hand. It could be trade, dialogue, relationships, uh, genealogy. And I'm uh, really proud of the Nez Perce for discussing with us this reaching across the divide because clearly it's part of their history going back millennia and together it makes us a better people working together and that's my takeaway well it's been wonderful to come here on this uh, lewis and clark trail heritage foundation visit to the lolo pass and it's amazing when you read about it you hear people talk about it, to, to, but to be here and hear people from the Nez Perce tribe actually describe their experience as members of the tribe in this area and part of their ecosystem, uh, it really makes the experience live and vivid for you. And certainly I can think about it at home, but to stand here and listen and feel and smell and see what this feels like and what it must have felt like to Lewis and Clark. There's nothing to compare with it. So I hope you, if you ever have a chance, come and see it and feel it and experience it. <laughs>